Hey, how is everybody? Well, happy Father's Day, dads. Um, glad that you are here and joining us. Uh, before we get into our sermon time, I want to do something special this morning. Um, I, I want to invite a couple up here, and as they make their way up, I'll tell you a little bit about um, what they're doing. I want to invite up uh, Mike and Christine uh, Mastin. Where are you guys? I know you're out there somewhere. But y'all come on up this way. Why don't y'all give it up for Mike and Christine? Welcome them. Yeah, y'all can just come on up here. That's great. Y'all can come up the stage. Um, So I want to tell you a little bit about these guys. A lot of you in the congregation know Mike and Christine. Uh, They've been faithful members of Buncombe Street for, uh, what is it, 18 years. So um, 18 years. And the really cool thing about what they're doing to get to the point is that Mike and Christine, Mike has felt a call to ministry. So he's been sensing that for some time. But if you remember back, um, probably, it may have been, I don't know, about six months ago or so that, that Mike got up and shared a testimony here in front of the church. And when he did it, there were so many people, he probably felt overwhelmed because I saw all the people who were coming up and telling him what an awesome job that he had done. And he went through quite a journey with some major back problems, and Mike shared that story. And I don't know how many of you remember that Sunday, but Mike has been on a journey since then, um, fulfilling a call to ministry. And so Mike in two Sundays from today, is taking um, two United Methodist Church appointments. Um, I'm going to let him tell you a little bit more about that, but um, he's going to Gray Court and Owings, right? UMC. So he'll be sharing one of those appointments with John Farney, uh, who was the our former youth pastor here at Buncombe Street. So um, just a lot of crazy ties, but I wanted to give Mike a little opportunity just to share with you about what he's doing this morning, and then we're going to pray over him as a congregation. Thank you, Justin. I understand that the spouse of a pastor could easily be uh, neglected, overlooked, or underappreciated. Amen. I'm sure Jenny yeah, feels that yeah, as well. Hey, man. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I want you to know that you're, you're a vital part of this ministry. Hmm. And any time, please just remind me just to carve out some time for us. <laughs> as Justin said, we, we've been here 18 years now at Buncombe Street and seen a lot of, a lot of the changes and a lot of growth during that time. Uh, What we're going to miss most of all is is you, our family. The relationships that that have developed over that time. And if I could ask anything from you before for your prayers, that this ministry just be bathed in prayer to honor God that that as we serve at Gray Court and Owens, that he would use us to, to draw his people closer to him. And to bring those that don't know him into a relationship with him. So thank you, Justin, for starting this ministry out in prayer. Yes, sir. And I'm proud of Mike for pursuing the call. It is, um, it's a serious thing, and it's a hard call to answer sometimes. And so uh, we're just proud of them. And here, here's what we're going to do this morning. I'm going to ask you guys, if you all can go down kind of to the front, and I'm going to invite the church forward, just anybody who wants to come forward uh, to come and to pray over these guys. We're just going to lay hands on them as we send them out into the world to do some good but hard work. If you're in your seat and just want to extend a hand towards them, you can if you don't feel comfortable coming forward. So let's let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that's here right now, and um, Father, we just pray over our brother and our sister, Lord, as we get ready to send them out to do the most important work on earth, which is sharing the gospel and the good news with the world. Um, Lord, I want to pray over Mike right now. I want to pray for discernment and clarity, Lord, each week as he studies, each week as he figures out how to love on people, as he marries people, Lord, as he uh, performs uh, funerals for folks, Lord, with people in times of grieving. Um, Lord, as he leads a congregation, I just ask you, Father, to give him wisdom, Jesus. I know that you've called him, and so I know that you'll make a way. 
want to pray over uh, Christine right now, Lord, just as Mike said, um, the, the spouse of someone in ministry, Lord, is such a critical part to this. And we just pray for her. We pray for um, her excitement and her passion. Pray on the days that Mike is down and that he's discouraged, that she lifts him up, that she speaks truth into him, that she is his rock, she is his supporter, um, Lord Jesus. And I just pray over the two of them and their house. I pray that you protect them from the evil one. I pray, Lord, that you instill in them a sense of um, your presence, Lord. Uh, and Father, just continue to be with them along this journey, Lord. When it feels like sometimes that uh, the waves are against them, Jesus, I know that you are with them. You will walk with them. And so I just thank you for this moment. We commission them and we send them out in the name of the church and in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. So um, I do, once again, want to say Happy Father's Day and hope that you do get a donut if you are a dad. Uh, did, did dads get a donut this morning? Did you get one? Hope that you got one. If you're not a dad, don't get a donut because I know if I tell everybody to get one, all the kids will get four or five. So don't do that. Just dads, 11 o'clock. If you come to 11 o'clock, you get to get the leftover donuts no matter who you are. But right now, just dads, thank you, diabetic dads. Thank you so much. So um, also, just want to remind you, for those of you that are struggling today, Father's Day can be a hard day uh, as, as you remember your dad, or maybe you didn't have a good experience with a father. I just want to tell you that our hearts go out to you, and you're in our prayers today. So, Surprisingly, I'm not going to focus today's message on Father's Day. I'm actually going to take it uh, a little bit of a different direction. We're going to start a new series today, and the series is called Let's Talk About Prayer. Let's talk about prayer. And so for the next three weeks, we're going to spend time talking about our prayer life. Now, listen, I know that you go, Justin, you talk about prayer all the time. Okay, so here's why. Three reasons. Number one, Jesus said it was important. Number two, Jesus said that it was important. Um, and then the third one. Exactly. So we're going to continue talking about it, and we're going to hit prayer from several different angles over the course of the next few weeks that we really haven't hit it at yet. And I want you to be here next week because next week's going to be really important to our prayer ministry. What we're going to be doing is casting some vision about what we want the prayer ministry of this whole church to look like. Along with that, I'm going to have somebody who's been a part of a very vibrant and exciting prayer ministry in another church get up and give testimony. So we're going to kind of have like a, a conversation next week and share with you some hopes and dreams for this church and what prayer ministry will look like. So you don't want to miss it, all right? You going to be here? Good, awesome. I'm praying that you will. Um, so here's what we're going to talk about today. One question that we want to answer today in our time together, and here it is. You ready for it? Why should I receive prayer. Why should I receive prayer? In other words, why is it that I would want to get up out of my seat and go have someone else pray over me? Or why is it that I would want to ask the pastors to pray over me? Why is it that I would ask someone else to pray over me? If I have my own phone line to God, if I have my own direct phone line and I can talk to him myself, why is it that I would want somebody else to pick up their phone line and call God for me? It's a pretty important question for us to ask. Several years back, um, we decided at the church that we wanted to start a formal, official prayer ministry here at the church. And part of that was that we wanted to have what we called altar ministry, where at the end of the sermon, you could come up and get prayed over. Now, our church has been a little bit hesitant to do this. I remember the first few weeks we had prayer ministers up here. They were just kind of standing, and I was like, uh-oh. Like, this is going to take some building of a culture. Um, but we have to answer the question, why? Because I will tell you this about my experience growing up in the church. Everybody in the church agreed that prayer was important. 
And probably 90% of the people in the church said, you know what, I'll be praying for you. But about 90% of the church, I never saw pray for anybody. Maybe 95%. In fact, everybody's like, I'm praying for you, Justin. I know you're going to, you know, you know, grow up and be a wise young man, and you know, we're praying for you. But nobody ever actually prayed for me. And so it was really important to me when I became a pastor that we had a place where people could actually come forward and receive prayer. And I don't know if some of you realize that you're in a place of privilege where you actually get to do that on Sunday. Amen? Okay, so, um, so listen, here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at one of my favorite scriptures, and it's really the scripture that we've been um, kind of building our prayer ministry around. It's James chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. It's James 5, 13 through 16. And here's what I want you to do today is I want you to stand with me, and we're going to read, um, I'm going to read the scripture, and, and I just want you to hear, hear these words. James 5, 13 through 16 says this. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call on the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Heavenly Father, I ask you right now um, to help us just be more comfortable talking to you with other people. Um, I ask you, Jesus, to give us courage to be willing to pray for one another and with one another. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. So, you know, I'm kind of a big fan of threes. I don't know if that's because I have a lot of Baptist in me, but I like to do three points. So we're going to do three points this morning. Three points, why should I receive prayer? Each of these points is going to be pulled from the scripture that I just read. So number one, why should I receive prayer? It allows me to lean on the faith of others. It allows me to lean on the faith of others. When you hear someone else pray, you literally see and hear their faith. Now, I don't know about you, but my faith tends to wax and wane. It's kind of like a roller coaster. Uh, is anybody with me? I mean, does it kind of feel like some days, like you have a direct line to God, He hears you, life is grand, y'all are buddy buddies. And then other days, it feels like you pray. And God's just like got his beats on up there in heaven, like listening to his music, and you're not getting through. I mean, there's just days where you feel close, and there's days where you feel distant. Um, notice what the text today says, though. It says, James 5, 14 through 15. First, it says, is anyone among you sick? Let them call on the elders of the church to pray over them, which tells me, number one, that we need to have our pastors ready and willing to pray over you, which every week... I'm here to pray for you up here in this corner. So the Bible says that that's something biblical. I always want to be there to do that. I go see people in the hospital who are sick. That's very important in our church that our pastors do that. Just a side note. But it says, let the elders of the church pray over them, anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And listen to this. And the prayer offered in what? In faith will make the sick person well says that the prayer offered in faith makes the sick person well. Now, pay attention. The way my theology used to work was that me being healed was all about my faith. So the Bible does tell us that it's about your faith when you do ask God whether or not your prayers are answered. But this text is saying it's actually about the faith of the person who's praying. It says the prayer offered in faith. In other words, if I'm going through a struggle and I need something, I go to someone who has faith and I ask them to ask God with me. The prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. There was a period in my life where I felt like I was totally leaning on the faith of other people. 
I went through a point in my life, one of the hardest times during my appointment at my last church, there was just a period of about a year where I was just struggling. And I remember one Sunday, I got up in the pulpit, and I really didn't need to get in the pulpit because I just honestly, I was just, I mean, I felt broken that day. And I got up, and I got ready to preach, and I just started crying. And you're looking at all these people who you're supposed to be leading And they're looking at me like, this ain't good. (laughs) Like when the pastor's crying, like, I I don't know, like he's supposed to be the shepherd and lead us, right? And and I'm like, I I just, I just couldn't. And and, and I just, I just kind of set the sermon aside and I said, look, folks, I was like, I'm just going to be real with you. I'm struggling with my faith. I'm just struggling. And I just cried. And I walked down the front and I said, would you pray for me? And I, and I, I do not, I, I, at that point, I really did not like having a lot of people pray over me. I just wasn't there yet. And I remember I went to the front of the church, and in a small church, you can, just kind of like we just did, the, the whole church, almost the whole church came, and they laid hands on me. And there were probably seven or eight people who took turns praying over me. And if you've never experienced that, like Mike and Christine just did, the laying on of hands, and the faith, you hearing other people who are going, God, give Justin discernment. God, give Justin joy. Uh, all these different people feeding into me, it, it, it built my faith. See, sometimes we just need other people to take our problems to Jesus for us. We, we need other people who are going to go, man, look, you know what? Let me, let me, just, let me just carry you to Jesus. Let, let me just walk with you to Jesus. Because here's the thing. Sometimes when we pray alone, we only hear one perspective of our problems. So I'll take my problem to God, and I have one view of it, one perspective. Give you an example. Um, Let's say somebody comes and asks for prayer, and they're struggling in their marriage. Let's say it's it's a wife. And, And if she was just praying by herself, her prayer may sound like this. God, my husband is a jerk. And I ask you to heal him. You ever prayed that prayer? Don't lift your hand. Okay? So it's one perspective. It's your faith journey, right? That's where you are. You want to heal him. He's a jerk. Everything he does is wrong. So you're praying. That's your lane. Now, if you come and be prayed for by a prayer team, there's a good chance that two people who are praying for you are going to hit that from two completely different perspectives. For instance, one person may pray, God, I ask you to humble this wife. And I ask you to remind her of the day that she said yes to him with her hand in marriage. You see what I'm saying? Another person may pray, Lord, I ask you to give her patience and joy in the midst of affliction. So it's other people's faith who are helping us Take our faith to the Lord. Um, You see, sometimes we need somebody else's faith to take us right to the throne room. To take us right up there to where the Lord is sitting. Somebody to remind us, man, look, I I know you're struggling, but listen, I've been there, but today I'm not there, so I'm going to pray with you. I just prayed with the people who are going to pray for you at the end of this worship service. And what we do is we pray for each other. We pray that we'll, we'll have joy, that we'll have excitement about prayer on Sundays. We pray that we'll be protected from the enemy. We encourage one another with our faith. God never meant for us to do it alone. Our prayer life was not meant to just be alone. It's a communal thing. So, number one, why should I receive prayer? It allows me to lean on the faith of others. Number two, it allows me to share my burdens. So, why should I receive prayer? It allows me to share my burdens. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2 says this. It says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Now, I know we live in, a, in an American society where everybody wants to do everything individualistic and we just kind of do life alone. But Jesus never intended for us to do life alone. 
We are a communal people. If we look all the way back from the beginning of the Bible until now, we are a communal people who are not meant to be just an individualistic society. And here's the deal. If you're struggling with something, instead of carrying it to the cross by yourself, why not ask somebody else to help you carry it there with you? It's not enough to go, hey, man, would you carry my burden? I want to share with you what I'm going through. And then you leave it at their feet. You ask them to carry it to the foot of the cross with you. That's what we're doing when we pray together. We're taking it to Jesus together. We're not taking it to somebody else. You're not just sharing your burden and saying, hey, I've got this big burden. Let me put it on your shoulders. If that's the case, you'll just weigh them down and everybody will be depressed. But rather, we are taking it to the foot of the cross. Let me help you take it to Jesus. See, James 5.16, it says, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be what? So that you may be what? Somebody over here is louder than everybody else. So that you may be healed. It says, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Now listen, it's not saying confess your sins to each other because we can forgive each other. I mean, we can forgive each other of something we've done to one another, but we, I can't forgive your sin. Only God can do that. So what it's saying is we confess our sins, we lay them at the foot of the cross together, and then we pray for each other. Because confession, together, we break the power of sin. When we confess it to our Savior, that's the way the Bible tells us that we break this thing that's chaining us as we confess it to God. You see, people find relief when they come and be prayed for. Um, it's interesting on Sunday mornings, if, if you'll watch people who come and they get prayed, and so, suddenly sometimes you'll see a breakthrough, and, and they'll just suddenly have tears just coming down their face as though something, something just broke, something they'd been carrying, and it's almost like you can just hear it snap. And, and it's because we're confessing our sins before a God who has the power to break them, a God who has the power to relieve us of them. We're, we're carrying this guilt and this burden on our shoulders, and then we take them to Jesus, and Jesus just goes, pop, and he breaks it. You see, when we carry our sins to somebody else, sometimes it helps us see our own sin from a new light. Sometimes I'll be praying, I'll give you an example. I might be praying with a father on Sunday morning, and a father comes up and goes, you know what, I just need to confess, I've just had an anger problem, and I've been angry with my children lately. And, and, and I'll say, well, let me pray for you, and as I begin to pray for them, I go, you know what? That sounds pretty similar to a problem I've got. I mean, we had, like, another dirty diaper, and, like, we've been potty training for weeks, and I got angry about it, and I shouldn't have. And I'm like, good grief, you did that again. I got, yeah, that's where we are. But, <laughs> but it, lets me, it lets me see things from another perspective when another person comes and goes, I'm struggling with this. And I go, man, I, I'm struggling with it, too. Let's carry our burdens to the Lord together. Maybe you're a woman in here, and, and, and you go, man, I, I get together with other women and pray, and we pray for our marriages against our husbands who are jerks, right? Those, you're all together in a group, and you all pray for one another. It's like we see things from another perspective. How powerful would it be if a group of addicts got together and addicts started praying for one another and you realize that you weren't the only person who was struggling with an addiction and you heard other people asking God to give them hope and to give them sustenance and to give them encouragement in the midst of the battle. See what I'm saying? You start to see things from other people's angles. What if we came together as parents of children with problems? What if all the parents who had teenagers in this church got together and started praying? I'm not knocking on teenagers, but that was a hard year, you know, some hard years for me. W what if instead of all calling each other and gossiping about how horrible and terrible these years are, what if we got together and said, we're just going to host a night where everybody who has teenagers comes together, and we're just going to pray. And we're going to pray over the kids, and we're going to pray for each other. And we carry each other's burdens together. See, the bond that happens when we pray together is like no other. If you're in here and you're married, do you ever pray with your spouse? I mean, now I know you fuss with them, um, but, but fussing doesn't tend to necessarily get us anywhere. But what if we all prayed together? There's something that happens when you pray together as a husband and wife. And listen, if you just happen to be here today and you're a single guy, I will tell you this. If you're looking for a godly girl, learn how to pray. Um, because that's sexy. To a godly woman, it is. If you're looking for the right woman, 
and you know how to pray and you're not afraid to pray. It really is. It's attractive. For, for a godly man, um, it's attractive for a woman to pray. And for a godly woman, it's attractive for a man to pray. And, and it's a bond that happens when we go, you know what? Let's stop worrying about this problem and let's just take it to Jesus. Because we can sit here and fret and worry about it all day, but let's just pray together. What about families that share their burdens together? Families that pray together at the dinner table. Families that ask the Lord to take care of their problems. Something happens to us, we pray together versus worrying together. So number two, it allows me to share my burdens. And then number three, here's the third one. Because the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Because the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. It's exactly what the scripture says. Praying gets things done. So the Bible tells us that praying will get us further than anything else that we can do. It gets us further than working hard. It gets us further than worrying hard. Praying gets it done. And we look at the Bible and we see over and over again that prayer works. I looked up some examples this week. I thought, well, where does prayer actually work in the Bible? Let me give you some examples. Y'all remember Hannah? Hannah's infertile and she prays for a son. God gives her a son. Peter's in prison and the church prays for his release. You remember what happens? An angel shows up and opens the door. Jerusalem's under siege in the Old Testament. Hezekiah prays to save his people. That night, the angel of the Lord kills 85,000 Assyrian soldiers. You might remember the story in the New Testament. Jairus asks Jesus to heal his daughter so that she won't die. And Jesus raises the girl back to life. Moses asks to see the Lord's glory. The Lord allows him to see him from behind. We know that Moses, when he comes out, his face was so bright that he had to wear a veil. Remember the story of Daniel. In order to save his friends' lives, Daniel praises God and asks him to reveal to him in a dream its interpretation. And not only were Daniel and his friends saved, but they were elevated to positions of authority in a pagan country. Story of Elisha and his servant. They're surrounded by an enemy, and Elisha praises God and asks him to reveal his power. Elisha's servant saw a vast army of heavenly hosts and fiery chariots that were circling the enemy. You remember Elijah. Elijah prays that it won't rain, and it doesn't rain for how long? Y'all need to read James. Three years. Three years it doesn't rain. The thief on the cross, he asked Jesus to save him during his dying moments. And what does Jesus do? Jesus tells him what? He says, the day you'll be in hell. No. <laughs> he says, the day you'll be with me in paradise. Right? He says, the day you'll be with me in paradise. He, he, answers, he answers the prayer. So James 5.16 says this. It says, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Now notice it says righteous person. Now, some of you in here think that righteous means perfect, but you don't have to be perfect. Our prayer teams are not perfect. You can ask any of them. They'll promise you they're not perfect. But I do believe we are righteous people. And righteous just means people who seek the Lord and seek to love him, seek to love him with all their heart, mind, and soul. And so if we are righteous, our prayers are powerful and effective. We pray because we believe, and we pray because we believe in the power of God. And let me tell you just a little bit real quickly about the vision for this church, and I want to share one other, one other thing with you. But sometimes people go, well, Justin, you know, where are you hoping that the prayer ministry heads? And I'm going to talk a lot more about this next week, but here's the deal. Here's what I would like to see. If I could answer in one sentence, this is what I think just from off the cuff that I would love to see our church be able to do. I would love to see every single person in this church be able and willing to pray for another person out loud. Jay, that's what I'm saying. That's what I thought. Yeah, that's right. Krista, who's been trying to get our prayer ministry going for years, right? And Krista and Jim are the chairs of our prayer ministry right now, and they've done an awesome and fabulous job. By the way, can you give it up for them for helping start this ministry? Um, but I, I, I think that's, that's a shortened version. Just everybody should be able to pray with somebody else. Like if you're here today and you can't do that, I want to figure out how do we give you the tools to be able to do that. Here's the other question. Um, well, why, why, why did you ever want to start a prayer ministry in the first place? Well, here, here's the deal. Um, I, 
I, like I said, I, I grew up and nobody was ever there to pray for me. Like, no, no, nobody was ever like there officially. And, and so when, when I was in my last church and, and we started having people who would actually be willing to pray for you openly, it was such a powerful thing that when I came to Buncombe Street, I was like, well, man, where, where, where's the ministry where we have where people can go and be prayed for? And they're kind of like, well, we don't necessarily really have an official one. So it's more for me than anybody. I want people who will come forward and pray over me. Don't you want that? I, I don't care if you do. I do. <laughs> I want somebody to pray over me. Um, it's what the Bible tells us that we should do. It's a selfish thing. I'll just be honest. I, it's selfish. And so here's the thing. If we're the body of Christ, if we're not praying together, how can we be healthy? And how can we complain that we don't have what we need if we don't ask? And our God is a good God who knows how to give good gifts, and we just have to ask. So let's figure out how to ask together. I want to share with you one thing as we end, and I wasn't planning on doing this, but I don't know how many of you know. Um, many of you here remember um, Mitzi McCall, who came several, um, probably, I don't know, a couple months back, and we prayed over Mitzi. And Mitzi had gotten really sick with, um, with cancer, and she's been battling cancer. And I don't know, does any, did anybody see, did Mike make it in here today? Did Mike come? Mike, he didn't come. He, Mike was going to come and try to make it, but Mitzi passed away this morning um, about 3 or 4 a.m. And um, Mitzi was such an awesome and amazing witness to this church. And I don't know when the services are. We'll let you know by email. But, um, you know, her faith encouraged us so much. We were talking about it in the band room that she came up into two weeks ago, three weeks ago, she was sitting right back there where they sit and was worshiping. And this morning we were talking about prayer and I was thinking back about the Sunday. And if Mike were here, I wanted to ask him if I could show this picture, but I, I, he, he's not here. Um, but I, I do want to show you a picture of our church um, praying over Mitzi, and I pulled this up on my phone this morning and asked the guys if we could show it. And I want to tell you something about this picture. Um, you know, I think about us praying over Mitzi, and, you know, she wasn't healed um, on this side of heaven, and we ask that she would be. But what I want to remind you is that sometimes what we ask for is not necessarily what the praying is all about. When we did that that day, it was a testimony to her faith. It was a testimony to how we interact as a family and how we love on each other. And, and it was a testimony of our trust in God in the midst of her sickness. And so I just wanted to show this this morning to honor her life um, and to remind you of the power of being prayed for. And so if you get a chance to reach out to Mike, just tell him how much you love him. And... Uh, Anyway, I'm just going to pray for you this morning. How about that? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I first of all want to pray and thank you for the life of Mitzi, and we just pray for Mike right now, Lord. Um, I ask you to comfort him this morning, Jesus. I ask you to fill him with hope and joy, Lord, as we pray for him as the body of Christ right now, Lord. I pray that our faith, Jesus, will uphold him in the next few days if his tends to wax and wane, Lord, like mine does. Father, we just pray that you send the right people, our family there, Lord, to minister to him. And Lord, I just thank you for her faith. I thank you that she came to church week after week. I thank you that Mike was going to come today, Lord, if he could have worked it out, Lord. What a, what a testimony. Jesus, I'm just reminded through her faith of how important it is that we reach out and cry out to you, Lord, in our times of need. So, Lord, I just pray that we become a praying church, Lord Jesus. We have to talk about it till we're blue in the face, that we, rem we remind each other and we encourage one another, Lord, of the importance of talking to you. Lord, I pray that not another day goes by that our prayer team stand alone because we understand that when we seek you, when we ask, when we knock, Lord Jesus, your word tells us that it's powerful and effective. So, Lord, I pray that we become a praying church, Father, who every Sunday we just have the front filled with people who are praying for each other, Lord. 
God, we're not praying because we have problems. Sometimes we're praying because we don't have problems and we're thanking you. We're just thanking you for the goodness, Lord. Father, forgive us for being people who only come to you when the problems hit. Lord Jesus, I just pray we come to you when things are good. When our marriage is good, when our kids are healthy, Lord, and we have jobs, that we come and we come to other people and say, let's just go to the Lord and give thanks. Father God, I thank you for all the good that you're doing in the life of our church. Lord, if we don't have anything else to be thankful for today, we have thankful. Uh, we can be thankful for our salvation. Our salvation in you, Jesus. The fact that you went to the cross and you died and you told us, Lord, that one day everything's going to be solved and fixed and we'll stand before you. Lord, if we know you, you're going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come on into my kingdom. So I thank you for this day, Lord. I just pray during this time, Lord, if somebody heard the message of salvation, somebody who doesn't know you, Lord, they confess that you were Lord today. They believe in their heart. And they'll be saved, Lord. Jesus, I just ask you, Father, during this time for uh, us to be open to coming forward and being prayed for and for our prayer teams to come up and us just to be ready and willing, Lord, to minister to one another. I pray that these altar rails are filled with people, Lord. I pray that we have to big, build bigger altar rails, Lord Jesus. We have so many people who are getting prayed for, who are coming to seek you on their knees. We thank you for this day. You are an awesome God. We love you, and we give you all the glory and praise. Amen. We're going to take up an offering right now. It's not just an uh, offering of our money, but it's an offering of ourselves. So I want to invite you to come forward and kneel. I invite you to come forward and be prayed for. Or bring your offering forward and put it in the basket. We'll receive communion in just a minute.